Thank you so much, Kay. Thank you, Lyle, Isa, and Susan for such a wonderful discussion, which reminds me, having just watched recently, Julian Schnabel film at Eternity's, Eternity's Gate with Willem Dafoe playing Vincent van Gogh in his very last years. Uh, I would like to remind you a very interesting fact that some of you who have read Van Gogh's famous letter to his brother Theo might remember Vincent upon being released in 1890 after having spent a year in an asylum at Saint-Rémy de Provence have compelled Theo, his brother, to ask Dr. Gachet, who is now famous among us because his two portrait was painted by Van Gogh, but otherwise known in France at the time as homeopathic doctor and founder of group therapy, he was asked to help Vincent with his mental condition. Vincent's first impression of Gachet was unfavorable as he wrote to his brother. I think, I'm paraphrasing, I think that we must not count on Dr. Gachet at all. First of all, he's sicker than I am, or shall we say just as much, I don't think if one man Blind men list the other blind men. Don't they would fall into the ditch? However, in the letter dated two days later to his sister, Wilhelmina, he shared a different observation altogether by saying, I have found a true friend in Dr. Gachet, something like another brother. So much do we resemble each other physically and also mentally. My point for those of us who have read also in college, Michel Foucault, 1964 classics book, Madness and Civilization. We do remember the very fact that when the shame are writing about the insane, they aren't just describing what it meant to be insane. They are defining just what it means to be normal by contrasting that with insanity. This is because insanity in, in insanity are socially constructed categories. People identify being normal and define that through their description of the abnormal. That's the reductive view which we don't subscribe to that easily. For none of us would ever look at Vincent van Gogh's painting, any painting of his really, and feel pity for the painter. We feel instead the vitality of life's energy and compassion that radiate from the painting our onto our skin, into our bodies, to our whole being, really. We are grateful, therefore, to Vincent van Gogh, to artists like him, like those at Fountain House, who essentially have different accesses to reality than we do. That's my very thought for the moment. Are there any final thoughts you would like to share with our audience? Kay, Lyle, Isa, and Susan? Yeah, I have a question for Kay. And in, in, in the reading that I've done uh, of your work, in, in, all, in the time that you've spent working on, you know, problems of, of creativity and, and, and mental illness, can you kind of give me an overview about how you think the, uh, sort of creativity fits into basically our, our mental makeup as, as human beings? And, you know, do we all have a kind of you know, a kind of creativity that might be lurking there. Just trying to get a sort of larger view of this from, from you. Well, I think that certainly creativity is probably not unique to humans. Uh, there are all sorts of animals that go out and explore and put things together in different sorts of ways. But um, it's, it's obviously most strongly associated with humans. And I think it's uh, just incredibly important to our survival. I mean, I, there's no way that we could have done what we've done over the, uh, the millennia without having been able to come up with new ways of, of approaching things. But what's interesting is how far back it goes in terms of art is that, you know, it's one thing to invent your way off an island uh, where it's highly practical, makes sense and so forth. But, but why art? And I, I've just been writing something for a book and it was looking at the Neanderthal literature and these, you know, these right. ancient, um, ancient, ancient, 180,000 years old uh, uh, paintings and uh, structures that were put together that were clearly art. I mean, no, quote, practical value. Uh, and what is that? And what does that give to people, you know? And, and how extraordinary it, it really is. And, and I think it's something that I, 
I don't take the point of view that everybody's creative and, you know, you just have to bring out the creativity. I think that sounds good. I think it makes teachers feel good. Uh, I think it makes parents makes them feel good, but I don't think there's a whole lot of evidence. That obviously everybody's creative to a point, but there's just so obviously some people who are just unbelievably innovative and have, and have gone through, as you all were talking about, you know, in terms of, uh, a lot of adversity and a lot of abuse and so forth. And somehow you came out creating. Uh, and that's, that's an extraordinary thing. It's a very deeply human and wonderful thing. Yeah. And it, it's helped us. It, it, as we create, it helps us heal. You know, I, I found looking back on a lot of paintings that I've done six months later, a year later, and saying, ah, I, I see what I was going through there. And, I, and it helps you understand. It's like self therapizing on yourself a little bit, you know? And so. It, it, it's, it's healing. It's, it's, I couldn't have healed without it. Yeah. The, the other insight I, I, I've had, and it's, it's not <laughs> obviously not unique to me. Uh, and that is this idea that, you know, for, for years, for decades, for, for, for a century, at least, there's been a, a kind of notion that insiders and outsiders are somehow, they're different, that art world people have their own set of issues that Artists inside the art world do one thing and artists outside the art world, they do something else. And that's been used as a stick to beat, you know, insider artists for a long time. It's like the only real art comes from people who are outside the system. Uh, mm. And likewise, the, you know, mm. the, the comment that, you know, people outside the system are really not making art at all. They're doing something else. But what's really fascinating to me is that the, the, the more carefully I look at all this work and indeed, the more attention we pay with the assumption that the work that we're looking at is some form of meaningful formal communication, the more we realize that the distinctions between insiders and outsiders are really difficult to maintain. When what we're really seeing is a kind of a merging of two worlds and that, that actually the, the, the barriers between them are in many ways, there are obviously cultural constructed, but they're, but they're also they're deeply misleading. Uh, and that's been really interesting to see. It's, it's no accident that so many contemporary artists are looking at, at so-called outsiders, not as a way to, to, in a sense, to trash the art world, but they're looking for inspiration. They're looking for people who share techniques, commitments, uh, formal, prop, you know, formal uh, awareness. All those things, are, uh, they are being shared. And that's, to me, that's a, a very interesting moment. Uh, in the way we're looking at, at contemporary art, for sure. Right, right. I agree with you. It's kind of like how Picasso was looking to African art to then develop Cubism. And I think that's kind of what we're on the precipice of right now. And I think the outside art will merge with the contemporary, or if it hasn't already. And we're going to see an explosion of something else that is contemporary and very, very indebted to the outside. Yeah.